Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So continuing with Surah Nisa, verses 94 onwards. In this case, Allah says, O you who have believed, when you go forth to fight in the cause of Allah, investigate. Do not say to, to one who gives you a greeting of peace, you are not a believer. Aspiring for the goods of this world. For with Allah are many acquisitions. You yourselves were like that before. Then Allah conferred his favor upon you. So investigate. Indeed, Allah is ever with what you do acquainted. Now, this was another huge test on the believers. So as we've seen before, the believers were told that uh, Muslims outside of Medina, they need to do hijrat and they need to come to uh, the city of, uh, of Medina. If they are able to do hijrat and they refuse to, then Allah said that they are now called what? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. And Allah said that if you are, if you enter into a battle with their tribe, you are permitted to kill them because they are basically what? Hypocrites. They are, yeah, they're not really uh, people who have iman. They are choosing to side with their kafir tribes instead of siding with the Prophet, um, even though they know that their tribe is attacking the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So they cannot really be considered to be believers unless we're talking about women and children and so on. Or unless we're talking about people and, and you you have a peace treaty with their tribe. In that case, of course, this is not offensive. This is a defensive. So you don't just go and start attacking the other tribe, right? Now Allah is explaining that if a Muslim has entered into a battle, okay, so there is a war going on between your tribe, between uh, the, the Muslims and uh, the enemy. And in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of the battle, while you're about to kill the enemy, this is the enemy, no, he doesn't do such that. The enemy ah. gives you a greeting of peace. Now, that could mean, like he says, assalamu alaikum, a, yeah, a greeting of peace, or he uh, he actually recites the kalma. So he he says something which makes it very clear that he has become a Muslim. Uh -huh. Okay? Allah is saying, on that very moment, you need to control your anger and put your sword down. You can no longer kill that person. Imagine how difficult that is. So you are in battle, you are fighting, and there's this enemy who's charging towards you to kill you. And in the middle of your fight, you are able to overcome him. And just as you're about to kill him, if he gives you a greeting of peace, or if he were to especially recite the kalma, on the spot, you need to uh, excuse him. And at that very moment, he's become your brother in faith. But how are a disbeliever know the kalma? Ya assalamu They knew that, of course, you know, it was it, it was uh, information that had been passed on by that time. And now this was, it was a huge test because it's really, really difficult to do. Okay, and Allah was saying that there are um, a few reasons, of course, why um, a, a believer at that time might be inclined to just ignore and still kill the enemy. Number one, of course, is revenge. You have so much anger especially at that time when you are fighting. And the Allah is saying, remember, you're fighting in the cause of Islam. So if the person you're killing has embraced Islam, then this fight no longer continues, mm -hmm. right? For that individual, you have to let him go. And then another reason might be that, you know, sometimes uh, the, the believers would start to think that, okay, if the, you know, if we're having a battle with the enemy tribe and the enemy tribe now understands that the Muslims are overall winning and we have to surrender, and if the entire enemy tribe embraces Islam, then that basically means that the war is over and they have now become your brothers. Now, can you therefore take any spoils of war? No. No, because now that the battle, in one second, the battle is over. They are no longer your enemy. They, they are no longer captives. You now have become um, brothers in faith. Uh, of and the so, same time. no, hold on. And so... Some Muslims would have this, uh, some Muslims might have this idea that, okay, if they all embrace Islam, then we cannot take spoils of war. And of course, that greed element is there as well. Sometimes you're fighting and the thing that encourages you to fight is the spoils of war. So Allah saying, control yourself. You're not doing this for revenge. You're not doing this for spoils of war. You're doing this for Allah. So if at that moment they embrace Islam, you need to back off and you need to show them mercy because they have now become Muslims. Now, on one occasion, what happened? Uh, Hazrat Usman al-Islam. Uh, Hazrat Usama. Hazrat Usama, Usama, Usama. Um, uh, there was a, a specific battle that uh, he was sent to. And, it, it, you know, while fighting, um, he was able to overcome the enemy. And the enemy did recite the Kalma. And despite doing that, Hazrat Usama killed him. 
Now, eventually, of course, news of that incident went back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he, he summoned him. He called Hazrat Usama and he said, you know, did you do this? And Hazrat Usama said, yes, of course I did this. And the Prophet was, was visibly very angry and he, he asked him why he did this. And Hazrat Usama said, but, you know, he told the Prophet that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it's obvious that the guy did not really embrace Islam. He, he just said it because he knew I was about to kill him. And, and he knew he said, that I. He knew that I had become overcome. Yeah. And then he said that. Uh, did you rip open his chest and look at his uh, niyat? So how? So then the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him said that <clears throat> if that is the case, why didn't you rip open his chest, tear out his heart, and look inside and see if there was iman or not? In other words, iman lies in the heart. It is something only God knows about. Nobody has the right to judge. How can you say that he's just saying it? There was no belief in his heart, even though it seems pretty obvious. But still, what is going on in his heart is only something that Allah knows. It's not your job. And then the Prophet said, to, he told Usama, what will you do on the day of judgment when the kalma testifies against you? So the kalma will testify against you and tell Allah that I was spoken by this man and yet, this, uh, and yet Hazrat Usama killed him. Okay, now imagine for one second that the kind of things me and you, the kind of things we do every day, where there is like, you know, we, we forget about God. We forget about Allah's commands because we are like, oh, but yeah, but I, I was so angry. My emotions were this. I was so frustrated. How was I supposed to control myself? You know, just because somebody, uh, somebody perhaps hurt you or somebody said something which, um, which kind of annoyed you. Imagine this situation, the person is killing you. And you are being told back off because he recited the kalma. This is the maximum level of taqwa, where you really have to, in one second, convert that rage into love, because guess what? He's now your Muslim brother. Uh, did a verse uh, come a later on uh, forgiving you, Sama? Well, the, again, forgiveness is all in the hands of Allah. Allah can forgive. This is not something which every normal human being can do. This is incredibly difficult. And so again, uh, these are questions which you often ask, I've noticed. <sighs> and not just you, a lot of people ask this. This is not our prerogative. What's important is not who will have, you know, who will have to face what consequences on the Day of Judgment. What's important is... We have to look out for ourselves. What will you have to face on the day of judgment? <clears throat> this is a beautiful. This is something everyone asks. Oh, so then what? You know, uh, what will be the fate of this person, or uh, what's going to happen to that person on the day of judgment? Well, ask yourself, what's going to happen to you? Do you have this level of taqwa? Right. Um, and so this is what Allah is again warning the Muslims about. So then Allah says, "Not equal are those believers who remained at home, other than the those who were disabled." And the, uh, the Mujahideen, in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives, Allah has preferred the, the Mujahideen through their wealth and their lives over those who remain behind by degrees. And to both, Allah has promised the best, but Allah has preferred the Mujahideen over those who remain behind with a great reward. Degrees from Him and forgiveness and mercy, and Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Or, or what does mean? The people who migrate? No, that's Muhajireen. To do oh, hijrat, to do right. Uh, Mujahideen are those who do jihad. Oh. Okay, so Allah is saying over here now, at this moment, jihad was not first. Jihad was being encouraged. The Muslims were being told the Prophet is going out to fight, so go ahead and join him. It's a good thing to do. It will give you a lot of, of ajr. Um, you know, you, you might even become shaheed, which is the best death. But it was not first at this moment. Because Allah knew if he made it first, what would happen? A lot of them will leave Islam. Yeah. So um, what Allah, this is one of the verses where Allah is encouraging them. Allah is saying that, okay, some of you go out and you fight alongside the Prophet. Some of you <clears throat> prefer to stay back home. It's not that you're lying. It's not that you're giving any excuse. Jihad was not first at that time. So the Prophet said, if you want to join, we are leaving. Uh, uh, those who are interested, come and join. So many of them said, okay, well, I'm sorry, but we're just not interested. And so they would stay back. So Allah is saying, because it's not first right now, that's okay. But Allah is saying, I prefer those will have a higher degree, a higher status and rank on the Day of Judgment who went out and fought. So this was a means of encouraging them. Allah is not saying that those who stayed behind will be punished because it's not first right now. 
But later on, at the book, you will see, it became farz. And then those who stayed back, there were severe consequences. All right? Um, and so the, the message for us as well is, um, even though we don't exactly go out and fight in, in battles, any form of jihad that you do, when you are making the effort, you are you will have a higher degree in the eyes of Allah than someone who chooses to do the five-time prayer, zakat, fasting, everything, but no jihad. And this is how you go from the stage of Islam to the stage of Iman. Islam is all the five pillars. That's it. You want to go to the extra stage of Iman, you have to do one, you have to do two extra things. Number one, you have to have complete yaqeen on uh, in, the, in the day of judgment, which means you have to build up your level of taqwa. When you are certain that I will be standing in front of Allah, there, there will be many things about your behavior that you will change. You will be able to control your emotions a lot because you are certain that even on this uh, um, small occasion, I will be asked by Allah, why did you say this? Why did you behave like this? And number two, besides yaqeen and a boost in your taqwa, the second thing, jihad. You've got to start struggling. Okay? Um, then Allah says, Indeed, those whom the angels take in death while wronging themselves, the angels will say, In what, in what condition were you? And they will say, We were oppressed in the land. And the angels will say, Was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you to migrate? For those, their refuge will be hell and evil it is as, as a destination. Except for the oppressed amongst men, women, and children who cannot devise a plan, nor are they directed to a way. For those, it is expected that Allah will pardon them, and Allah is ever pardoning and forgiving. And whoever migrates for the cause of Allah will find on the earth many locations and a lot of sustenance and abundance. And whoever leaves his home as a, as a migrant in the cause of Allah, and his messenger, and then death overtakes him, his reward um, has already been incumbent upon Allah, and ev <coughs> Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Oh, okay, now I get the last one. Okay, so as the last one is we see that if you leave to migrate to Medina, but you die on the, along the way, then... If you, if you migrate to Medina, or if you migrate in any place, but you are migrating in the cause of Allah. So, for instance, you are living in one country, and you are not able to practice your deen openly. Okay, there's a lot of oppression towards the Muslims. Now, because you cannot practice your deen, if you, if you decide, okay, I wish to now uh, migrate to another country where I can practice my deen, mm -hmm. then now migration is tough. It was tough then and it's even tough now because you have to pack up your bags, you have to go to a new country, you have, a, you know, you're not sure if you'll be able to find a job, sustenance, shelter, a home, a place, uh, you know, to send your kids to school. It's not easy to, to move to an, another place. But if you do it only and only for the cause of Allah, you're not doing it that, okay, I'll be able to practice Islam, plus I'll be able to get more income. I'll be able to get a better job and we all can have a better lifestyle and more money. Then you're not doing it purely for the sake of Allah. Oh, but that Allah says everyone. if it's purely, 100%, <clears throat> only for the sake of God, then he says while traveling, if death were to uh, overcome you, you are a shaheed. You are given the same status as someone who died while fighting in the cause of Allah on the battlefield. But it has to be only for the cause of Allah. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, what does Allah say? That if someone is oppressed, uh, um, you know, he's oppressed in his country. And so he, he can cannot, afford to migrate. He cannot he openly uh, practice deen. He can afford to migrate. He is physically able to, but he doesn't. Then what happens at the time of death? Uh, then when the, uh, when the angel takes out his guru, he will, uh, they will ask him, that in what a condition were you? And then he will say that, uh, that uh, I was oppressed and I was not allowed to practice my deen. Then the angel will say uh, that uh, the amount of dunya that was given to you, was that not enough for you to migrate? Not the amount of dunya, but was not the earth, uh, the earth spacious yeah. enough that you could not find anywhere else to go? Right? <clears throat> and this is applicable today too. If you are residing in a country where you are not able to... Um, you know, Pray five times a day. You're not as a woman. You're not permitted to take the hijab, um, or you, um, if you're, if you have to go out to the workplace in the work, there's a lot of haram that that's present, and you have to be part of that haram because you know it's the culture of that country, and you're doing it, but then you end up saying, well, you know, I'm I'm stuck. Uh, it's it's unfortunate, but I don't have any other choice. 
you you do have a choice migrate move away unless you are physically disabled it's impossible for you to move okay or unless you are a poor person and you don't have enough money to even move to the other country okay then in that case they can have the hope that they will receive allah's mercy and allah can pardon and forgive them and so allah says when you travel throughout the land there is no blame upon you for shortening the prayer if you fear that those who disbelieve may disrupt or attack you indeed the disbelievers are ever to you a clear enemy <clears throat> now this is talking about salat al khauf so in other words when you are in a situation of fear because the enemy is about to strike you so you are uh, moving towards battle and the enemy is surrounding you and you know that at any time um you know uh, the enemy can uh, they can launch a surprise attack on you mm-hmm. now you now you have to do your prayers even then you cannot say allah my situation is so tough i'm sorry imagine even in that situation allah saying that you can make the prayer very short but you cannot say okay no prayers now Those... even then the prayer has to be done it's called salat al khauf and it says when you are among them and lead them in prayer let a group of them stand in prayer with you and let them uh, carry their arms and when they have prostrated let them be in a position behind you and have the other group come forward which has not yet prayed and let them pray with you taking precautions and carrying their arms those who disbelieve wish that that you should be neglectful with your weapons and your baggage so that they could come down upon you in one attack but there's no blame upon you if you are troubled by rain or if you are ill for putting down your weapons but take precaution allah has prepared for the disbelievers a humiliating punishment So what salat al khauf is that um uh in one situation what you could have is that there's one imam who is leading the prayer and um you can split your, your army into two groups so one group will be standing behind the imam and allah is saying that if the situation is such that you know the enemy can attack at any point then do your prayer with your weapons in your hands do not put your weapons down so that if uh there is a surprise attack by the enemy then um you can immediately take your weapons and you can start <laughs> fighting yes i said you can start fighting but they didn't have guns they only had swords ha ha very funny rafi so um so uh in that situation so you have one group that is standing right behind the imam and they have their swords and they have their shields everything their armor and they're praying and the other group is not praying so the other group is keeping a watch out for the enemy Now once um the imam has done the first the first raka and he's come down into the uh, sajda position then bef- uh, before he stands up for the second second uh, raka the group that has prayed the first raka they can now um uh, end their prayer they will now move behind and they will now take uh, take positions and the second group which did not pray they will now come into their positions and stand behind the imam Okay so what that basically means is that the uh, imam in in that situation does two rakahs and each group in the army is able to do at least one rakah one question mm-hmm. uh during this a uh, one rakah uh, in the first rakah of the namaz uh, there is no uh, atiya to and it's a second part right hmm. so uh, the people who only do one raka will they have to uh, add that in the first well, uh, yeah. and then end it? yeah because then they will have to formally end their prayer but the imam will stand up so that the second uh, the second group can now join him and then of course if uh, now in some situations you can also do four as well which means that one group does two uh, rakas and then the other group comes and then they do two rakas so that the imam does four but each group is allowed to do two in any case the basic idea being now you can do four or you can do two it depends on the situation mm-hmm. if the enemy is very close by and you have a huge threat then shorten it to just two so that each person gets to do at least one uh, raka but if you know that the threat is not that much you can do four okay that's what you call salat al khauf but again the idea is allah saying if you are ill or if there is rain you know because when it's raining then your weapons and carrying your armor becomes even more difficult So that's why Allah is saying in that situation you can put your arms down but if you know the enemy is very close by the enemy wishes for you to be neglectful so pay attention even if that's the case keep your weapons close so that if there is a surprise attack you know exactly um how to so start fighting So if there's a surprise attack uh, can you leave your namaz Of course 
But you said you can't leave the namaz, you, you can't, you know, miss the namaz. You cannot miss it in the sense that there's no surprise attack yet, but you just decide that there will now be no prayer because the enemy might attack. You have to do namaz. But if while doing your prayer, something happens which causes you to have a life and death situation, you're supposed to break it and you're supposed to fight. Right? Allah does not say, no, keep doing the prayer and let the enemy kill you. Islam is not about that. Islam is about, it's a very realistic religion. It's very, very practical. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then Allah says, when you have completed the prayer, remember Allah standing, sitting or lying on your sides. So in every situation, constantly do zikr. But when you become secure, then reestablish the regular prayer. So this Salat al-Khawf, of course, is only in this situation. But once you know the threat is over, the enemy has gone away, now do the proper prayer the way it should be done. Indeed, do it again? No, the other prayers. Oh. Indeed, prayer has been decreed upon the believers, a decree of specified times. And do not weaken in pursuit of the enemy. If you should be suffering, so are they suffering, as you are suffering. But you can expect from Allah that which they cannot expect. And Allah is ever knowing and wise. Any idea what that, what that means? You can expect from Allah that which they cannot expect. Uh, basically that, that Allah will help you. So Allah is saying at times it gets exhausting. It gets tiring. The enemy, the entire Arabia is basically trying to extinguish Islam. It can be very exhausting. But Allah is saying, remember, if you are tired, they are tired too. It's not like they are superhumans. Right? If you are exhausted and you have wounds and injuries, they have it too. But you have something which they don't have. You have the hope that Allah will give you mercy because Allah is standing by your side, Allah is not standing by their side. Mm -hmm. So beautiful way of again motivating and encouraging them that don't give up. It can be exhausting, you can have your energy depleted, <clears throat> but this is a way of um, encouraging them. Then Allah says, uh, Indeed, we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, the book in truth, so you may judge between the people by that which Allah has shown you. Do not, and do not be for the deceitful, an advocate. And seek forgiveness of Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Now we're suddenly moving from Salat al-Khawf, from prayer to in that situation, to the fact that the Prophet, and through the Prophet, of course, the Muslims are being told, when you judge, be very careful about how you pass judgment between people who might be fighting. And this is incredibly important because this is part of you being a Khalifa. Now in this situation, there was an interesting um, event that had taken place. There was a hypocrite um, who had apparently stolen something. And it's believed that maybe he had stolen, uh, in, some, uh, in some narrations they mentioned that maybe it was a bag of flour or something. And he stole it and um, he wanted to keep it in his house, but then he was afraid that if I keep it in my house and eventually the shopkeeper, when he tells you, uh, when he uh, um, announces that I have a bag of flour missing, then of course people will start to search and they might search my house and they might find it. So instead he went to his neighbor, who's a Jew, and he told his neighbor that, listen, I just bought this bag of flour and I don't have any place to keep it in my house. So, um, you know, he said, would it be okay if I kept it in your house for just a couple of days? And the Jew said, yeah, sure, no issues. So the Jew? He was a Jew. So the bag of flour was then kept in the man of, uh, in his house, the house of the Jew. So uh, now, of course, eventually when the shopkeeper realized, now this is in Medina. So the shopkeeper has done his count of his inventory. He's realized that there is a bag of flour missing. So, of course, everybody was informed and they started searching. And again, in, in some narrations, it mentions that perhaps because of the, the bag of flour, maybe there was a hole in it. And so as the hypocrite was taking it, the flour, was, um, the flour kind of left a trail. But in any case, eventually, the Muslims arrived at the door of the Jew. They opened up his house to check because they were checking everyone's house and they found it. And, and as soon as they questioned him about it, they said, well, this is not mine. This is my neighbor's. He told me that he bought it and he, uh, and he requested that I should keep it. And uh, as soon as they questioned the hypocrite, of course, he said, no, never. He's lying. This isn't mine. Now the case was brought in front of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now you can imagine it's very difficult because you have to pass judgment. Someone has stolen and there is a severe punishment for stealing. And it's just very hard to know because one person happens to be a Muslim and the other happens to be a Jew. 
Now, what happened was the family of the Muslim, the, the Muslim guy, of course, you know, they all came, they gathered, and they started to put pressure on the Prophet. You know, that this is a Muslim man, he's part of our ummah, how can you pass judgment against him? How would he ever go against you? Why would he ever steal? This guy's a Jew. And Jews have always hated you. And Jews have never been loyal. You can never take his side. Okay. Now, of course, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was very just. But at, what we keep forgetting is he's a human being. And now there is so much pressure on you. And people are saying this thing. And it does kind of cloud your judgment for a while. Yeah. So it's believed that he was, he, he didn't pass any judgment. But he was contemplating to perhaps side on on behalf of the muslim so he was inclined towards the muslim but as he was just thinking about it before he could say anything allah revealed the next two verses allah says um, and do not argue on behalf of those who deceive themselves indeed allah loves not one who is a habitual sinful deceiver they conceal their evil intentions from the people, but they cannot conceal them from Allah. He is with them in his knowledge when they spend the night in such as he does not accept of speech. And ever is Allah of what they do encompassing. Here you are, those who argue on their behalf in this worldly life, but who will argue with Allah for them on the day of resurrection or who will then be their representative? In other words, this entire family is now here trying to represent this man, trying to put pressure on you. And Allah is saying that he knows what their evil intention is. And he knows what they are quietly conspiring at night. And Allah is saying he does not accept of speech. So what they are speaking right now, what they are claiming right now, Allah is not accepting it. So it's very clear that what this family is saying, what this entire group of people are saying to support the Muslim, it's all a lie. Now, of course, Allah had to intervene to make sure that the Prophet does not pass judgment, which would be unfair, because what would be the consequence of doing something that uh, like this? What if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, by mistake, uh, uh, gave a judgment in favor of the hypocrite? Of course, he didn't know. Based on the evidence that he had, he said, okay, fine, the flower was found in the Jew's home, and the Jews saying that, that it's the Muslims, but we have no evidence that it was, in fact, uh, the, the Muslims. So... How can I punish the Muslim? Uh -huh. So what would be uh, the uh, what severe consequences would there be if an incorrect judgment had been passed? That uh, the Jews and the disbelievers would say that the Prophet is not uh, he does not make just decisions. He sides with the. It would be a huge repercussion because the Jew he knows that he know, uh, the Jew of course knows the truth. And the hypocrite knows the truth. These two people know exactly what the truth is. So if a judgment is passed against uh, uh, against the truth, then they both will be able to spread the news that you know this man cannot be a prophet because how could God not have told him what exactly the truth is? Like an average human being, they could have been confused. How can a prophet be confused? So Allah in instantly intervened and gave the correct judgment to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But of course, what do we learn from this is that when you are passing judgment, get all the information. Do not let your emotions cloud your judgment. Make sure that you get all the information possible and then you uh, uh, pass judgment, which is fair. Do not fall, succumb to the pressure that different people might be placing upon you. Uh, and make sure that you take, um, you conduct a very thorough investigation. There should be no bias or prejudice against someone or towards someone. And so then Allah says, whoever does a wrong or wrongs himself, but then seeks forgiveness, he will find Allah forgiving and um, Allah will be very merciful. In other words, you've done a mistake like this, but you did tawbah, Allah can still accept it. But if you commit a sin and you will only earn it against himself, Allah is ever knowing and wise. Mm -hmm. But if you commit a sin and then you blame it on an, on an innocent person like this man was doing, then you have taken upon yourself two evils, two sins. One is you did a sin and an evil deed. And number two, it was a slander. You're blaming an innocent person. Uh, but you should have to be punished, right? Uh, even if you do tawbah, you should have to be given uh, the punishment by, you know, according to the Sharia. Well, yes. If you've done something wrong and you are, have been caught then you will then you will have to give get the punishment that has been ordained in the sharia 
But if before you were caught, you end up doing tawbah and you end up changing your ways, then we will see in the Quran that there can be forgiveness for such a person. So if there's someone who was spreading a lot of uh, uh, problems, he was doing a lot of mischief, and before he got caught, he did, he did his tawbah and visibly changed his behavior. It's become apparent that he has stopped spreading mischief, he has stopped spreading fasad, then there is forgiveness for him. One question, oh, if a person steals something and before he gets caught, he does a tawbah, right? So, so how will the people who catch him know that if he's alive or not about doing the tawbah? You when can't it, make a decision in that. When it comes to stealing, if, there are different, many different things you have to see in it. Number one, there is a punishment prescribed for stealing. And number two, even if he does tawbah in that case, if he has stolen, then there is a punishment that he has to face. And you'll see that as well coming in the Quran. So you're jumping to it. It's all mentioned in, in the Quran as well that even after the punishment has been given to a person who is a thief, he can do tawbah and he can uh, get forgiveness from Allah, but the punishment in the Sharia has to be given, right? In the case of mischief, so he's going around spreading facade, spreading confusion, but before you catch him, he has stopped. So it's not just that he did tawbah, okay? Because tawbah, as you said, that is something that happens in the heart. Mm -hmm. This is a person who has stopped spreading mischief. His behavior has changed, so now he's spreading goodness and he's not spreading evil. Mm -hmm. In that situation, Allah is saying that the punishment can be stopped. But when it comes to stealing, it, uh, it, uh, what has been made clear is that if you catch the thief, the thief has been caught and he, and he did in fact steal, then the punishment has to be given to him. before he gets caught? That tawbah is something between him and God. Then he will be saved on the day of judgment. Oh. But in this dunya, there has to be some consequence. Otherwise, the entire sharia actually gets wiped out. Because then there's no point giving anyone punishment. We can cancel all the punishments Allah has, has explained. Because every time you catch someone, if he does tawbah, then we can just say, oh, well, then there's no point giving him punishment. Right? Even for zana, we have seen there is a punishment and tawba. If you do the tawba, great, Allah will forgive you on the day of judgment. But there has to be some consequence here because the the point of giving punishment in this world is to deter, make sure other people don't do it. Otherwise, they'll say, "I can do it too," and when I get caught, I'll just do tawba. Simple. And besides this, you have to remember when it comes to stealing. Um, uh, there are many other things you have to take into consideration as well, like the situation of the economy. If the economy is in, um, uh, there's no welfare state. So there are poor people who are struggling and they have nothing to eat or drink. In that situation, if, they're, if they steal in order to survive, the punishment is cancelled. The Sharia only applies if everyone has enough and the, the welfare system is working mm -hmm. and still someone out of greed, simple greed, not to survive, but simply out of greed, they choose to steal. In that situation, the Sharia applies. Oh, and an example of this, uh, when Hazrat Umar was the Khalifa, it was, uh, yes. two, uh, two or one slave uh, came to him uh, with his uh, with his owner, and the person said that this person uh, killed my camel and ate his meat. Uh, and uh, and, Hazrat, uh, and Hazrat Umar uh, was about to give the punishment, but then he asked him uh, why he did it, and he told him that the man was not uh, giving him any food. Right. Right. So that is um, uh, that is one example. In fact, during Hazrat Umar's time, he cancelled the punishment for theft because there was a famine. So there was so, such shortage of food that people were people had resorted to stealing just to be able to survive. Okay, they had a welfare state, they had a proper uh, they had a proper ummah and an Islamic empire. But during a, a famine, there's a shortage of food. You just don't have enough. So as a result. Um, it was cancelled for that period of time. Verses 113 onwards, it says, And if it was not for the favor of Allah upon you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his mercy, a group of them would have, were determined to mislead you. So they were determined to make you pass a judgment that was wrong. Mm -hmm. But they do not mislead except themselves, and they will not harm you at all. And Allah has revealed to you the book and wisdom, and has taught you that which you did not know. And ever has the favor of, of Allah upon you been great. No good is there in much of their private conversations except for those who enjoin charity or that which is right. Or uh, if you're trying to have a reconciliation between people. And wh whoever does that seeking means to the approval of Allah, then we are going to give him a great reward. 
And whoever opposes the messenger after guidance has become clear to him and follows other th than the way of the believers, we will give him what he has taken and drive him into hell and evil it is as a destination. So first of all, what uh, Allah is explaining over here is that those people were trying to mislead Muhammad peace upon him and Allah was making it clear that what they failed to understand is that the Prophet is being guided by God. They cannot deceive God. Allah knows exactly what they did and it is silly of them to even think that they can actually get away with something like this because even Allah does not know, right? So Allah was clarifying that. At the same time, Allah is saying when it comes to private conversations, most private conversations that you have, there is not good in it unless you are talking to someone secretly because you are uh, planning to do something uh, good. Like, for instance, you're trying to reconcile two people who are fighting or you're tr you, you want to give charity to someone, so you're discussing it with somebody else. In that situation, private conversation is actually good. But generally, Allah is saying it's not good. Have public conversations. Who are you seeking for advice? That's because in a, public, in a public setting, more people can jump in. They can give you sincere advice. Uh, and they can uh, help to guide you in a better way. Because, you know, it's not like you have all the knowledge in the world. There might be other people who have some knowledge or they might say something which you have completely missed out on. So having it in a public situation is better. Having it very privately can lead to more harm unless you're doing it secretly because you are trying to protect somebody else and you are planning or perhaps you're planning to do something good. So you need to, you know, discuss how to execute the plan. In those situations, private conversation is okay. And also what Allah is explaining here is once the messenger has given an opinion, like in this case, the messenger passed the judgment that this hypocrite is in fact the one who is wrong. Then Allah is saying nobody can have anything against him. So in other words, that hypocrite's family then started crying and screaming and they, they started saying, oh, this is so unfair. How could the prophet go against us in favor of a Jew? You know, basically in, fa in favor of a kafir. This is absolutely wrong. Allah is saying when the prophet makes a judgment, everyone has to uh, accept it and they have to follow it. Otherwise, you are driving yourself towards Jahannam and Allah will take you to that and Jahannam. And that's why Umar is and decapitated the person who, you know... That, that that was another person, right? So in this, yeah, but still, yes. Yeah. So when the prophet passes a judgment, right? When the prophet passes a judgment, peace be upon him, you have to adhere to it. And then Allah says, "Yeah, you have a question." <laughs> One question that I have is that uh, the family of the person who committed the crime, they knew that the person had done something wrong, and yet they sided with them. So will there be a punishment for them too? I see you love these questions. These questions where you want to know what's going to be the fate of the no, other no, no. person. No, no, no. Is there a punishment for them? Do we know if the family knew? Yes, they did. How do we know? <laughs> Were you there? <laughs> we don't know. Oh, I shall. Yeah. We just know that this <laughs> incident took place. And as a result, this is what Allah is saying. If the family knew, if the family did not know, that is again Allah's prerogative. Allah has also mentioned in those verses that those who are sincere in their tawbah, their tawbah will be accepted. So he's given you that information too, right? Mm -hmm. Which means maybe the family knew and then they subsequently did tawbah, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> no, but a vase, uh, like if a person commits a crime, and uh, and it's uh, his family or a relative come and they know okay. that uh, the person is in the wrong yes. thing, but they still favor with them. Yes. So, uh, so is there any punishment mentioned for well, them in the Sharia? Well, if you had remembered yesterday's lesson, I think we mentioned in that that if someone does, if someone shares in an evil, they carry the burden of it. Do you remember that part? No. So is there a punishment for them? Again. No, the punishment is for the person who committed the crime. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the people who are secretly helping him out, they share the burden on the day of judgment. Okay? So now, please let me move on. <laughs> Stop looking at me like you have another question. Okay, then 116 onwards, Allah says, Indeed, Allah does not forgive association with him. He does not forgive shirk, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with Allah has certainly gone far astray. They call upon, instead of Allah, 
none but female gods gods and goddesses and they actually call upon no one but a rebellious shaitan now two questions i want to ask you well actually one question um allah saying over here he will not forgive shirk right mm -hmm. anything other than shirk he can forgive mm -hmm. and he says the reason i cannot is because people who are committing shirk have really gone far astray there is just no turning back for them so there is no way they will even do tawbah. So they are very, very misguided. No, but didn't the Quraysh do shit? Now, no, no, no. Uh, first of all, my question to you is, when you look at Bani Israel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at one point, Bani Israel committed shirk, right? So yeah. what did they do? They started worshipping a cow made out of gold. They started worshipping a cow. Um, did Allah subsequently forgive those who did Tawbah? No. He, uh, no. <laughs> because they were turned into uh, apes and monkeys. Wow. <laughs> wow. No. No, this uh, is interesting. <laughs> no, uh, uh, no, it was ordered to kill them all. Yes, but those who did Tawbah. Oh, yeah, I, I, no, yeah, they were forgiven. Thank you. So because... they committed shirk and then they did Tawbah and their Tawbah was accepted. Correct? Mm, that's right. Okay. Um, in the same way, uh, we I told you about a hadith as well, where there was a person who, in the time of Medina, he was a Muslim, and then he became an apostate. And then he later wanted to re-enter into Islam, and he sought the permission of the Prophet, and the Prophet gave him permission, so he was forgiven, and he re-entered into Islam, correct? Mm -hmm. Why does Allah say over here that those who commit shirk, um, they have gone so far astray, they can never be forgiven? But we have evidence where people were committing shirk and they were forgiven and their tawbah was accepted. Yeah, it's basically talking about the people who have a, who commit a shirk but don't uh, have like a moral compass on stopping, uh, stopping and committing shirk. Oh wow! They want to stop committing shirk. They don't that believe. That literally makes shirk. no sense. Good and job. They don't believe. <laughs> What the, uh, the answer to this question, which you should have given, is that when you are committing shirk because um, you have 100% understood Islam, you have 100% testified, there is no doubt left in your heart, yet you deliberately choose to go and start worshipping idols, that shows a person who is not serious about deen. He's not serious about his religion or about God. So he knows that this is wrong. He knows 100% that these gods and goddesses are absolutely false. There is no doubt left in his mind. But for his own personal agenda, he still chooses to worship the idols. He's not taking religion seriously. So Allah saying such a person has gone so far astray, you know, he has completely destroyed himself on the inside that his tawbah cannot be accepted because he would never do a sincere tawbah. Bani Israel, despite having witnessed so many signs and so many miracles, they did commit the mistake because it was something that shocked them. You know, that there's this fire and suddenly we threw in our gold and this cow came out. And there's this man called the Samari who we know is very religious and he's telling us that this is Allah. Do you understand? So they, some of them genuinely fell into doubt that maybe this is God. That's why those who subsequently remembered that Allah is, there's only one God. Allah cannot be an idol. We just ran away from the, from the nation of Pharaoh. The nation of Pharaoh, all they did was worship idols. And we're doing the same thing. So it hit them. They realized and then they stopped. But it was a situation, that's why Allah calls it a fitna. They were put into a fitna. It was, it was confusion for them. For a moment, they were, some of them were actually very confused. Those who did not have very strong iman. No, I'm same, confused. Same with the person over here. Why, why are you confused? Because you just said that they threw gold in the fire and then suddenly a cow came out. Wasn't the cow made? This is something I'll explain to you. No, that's what made it into a fitna. So was it black magic used? It was, it was, somebody was known for being a spiritual person and we will see so what happened. Jam. We will see what happened in the Quran, but somehow all it says is that a cow emerged from the fire. So many scholars uh, believe that something, he did something, and as a result, this cow emerged. Now what he did, we will see later on in the Quran, it mentions, but when the cow emerged, it became a fitna for them because many of them understood that, okay, a cow has come out of the fire. 
And this man is telling us, this man who we know, we consider him to be a saint. He's telling us that this is God. So then this has to be Allah. Okay? Mm. So that's why there, it was a moment of confusion. Right? If I were to build an idol with my hands, yeah. present it to you and say, hey guys, this is God. Now, a lot of you would say, well, how can this be God? Because you just made it with your own hands, right? Mm -hmm. What made it into a fitna was that it just emerged from the fire. Okay? And that's what, what caused a lot of confusion, which is why those who had very strong iman knew that this is a fitna, this is a test. God cannot be any uh, form of an idol. So this is wrong. But then a lot of people got confused. Right? Those who had weaker iman said, okay, maybe this is God. Mm -hmm. Understood? Um, and that's why there was forgiveness for them later on who did Tawbah. In the same case, this person who was in the, in the place of Medina and he became an apostate, most likely he never really understood Islam in the first place. So that's why he went back towards uh, worshipping idols. And then when he genuinely focused more on Islam and understood it and Iman entered his heart, he realized this is in fact the true religion. It makes sense. And then he wanted to re-enter into Islam. So that's why what Allah is saying is that for people like this, this verse, the reason I'm getting into this is that this is not a contradiction. Okay, this is Allah saying people who have testified, there is no doubt left. No, they no. understand everything, but for their own personal agenda or because, you know, they say, well, my forefathers, the, um, you know, my grandparents and all of them, they always worshipped idols. So I just have to do it, even though I know it's nonsense. In that situation, you've gone far astray because... There is, there's no more evidence that you need. You have all the evidence. Your heart knows it, but you're still doing it. All right? So then, and then when it comes to the female gods and goddesses, they had uh, those called, you know, Lat, Uzad, Manad. Manad. Right? These were uh, different goddesses that they had kept. It was believed that Lat was stationed in Taif. Uh, uh, Manad, uh, Uzad was stationed in this place called Nakhla. And Manat was stationed in a place called Kodaid. So the entire Arab region, basically, all the all the main cities had female goddesses, right? And Allah is saying, actually, what you're worshipping is shaitan. Because shaitan has driven you crazy, and you actually believe that these female goddesses can actually be gods, and you're worshipping them. And so then Allah says over here, when Allah has cursed, whom Allah has cursed, for he had said, I will surely take from amongst you servants a specific portion. Now, Allah, in the previous verse, he's talking about shaitan, right? That... These people are actually worshipping no one but shaitan. So now he's continuing on. Shaitan whom Allah had cursed. For he had said, I will surely take from amongst your servants a specific portion. The challenge that shaitan gave Allah, I will definitely misguide a significant portion of mankind. And I will mislead them. And I will arouse in them sinful desires. And I will command them so that they will slit the ears of cattle. And I will command them so that they will change the creation of Allah. And whoever takes shaitan as a friend instead of Allah, he has certainly sustained a clear loss. Satan promises them and arouses desires in them, but Satan does not promise them except delusion. The refuge of those will be hell and they will not find from it an escape. But the ones who believe and do good deeds, we will admit them to the gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide forever. It is a promise of Allah, which is the truth. And who is more truthful than Allah in his statement? Now, in some occasions, what the Arabs would do is they would actually slit the ears of the, cap, of the camel. And in some cases, they would say that if a camel has given birth to 10 young, then the, her ear should be slit. And when that camel dies, only the men can eat the meat of that camel because it's now specially preserved for men. Because, you know, during that time, they thought that women were disgraceful. So they said that this is an honorable camel, so only the, its meat can be eaten by men. And at times, they would slit the ear and they would just let the camel run. And the camel, of course, would be bleeding profusely and it would be in pain. And they would say that now we have slit the, the ear of this camel, so we are allowing it to run free, which means no one can sacrifice this, this animal anymore. This animal has been dedicated to our gods and our goddesses. It was like, it made no sense. And this is what Allah is saying over here, that shaitan drives them crazy. He gives them the dumbest ideas of how to torture animals, and they believe they're doing it to please their gods and, and their goddesses. Mm. And interestingly, Allah says, uh, sorry, Allah, uh, when the challenge was given, Shaitan told Allah, and I will command them so that they will change the creation of Allah. 
they will change the creation. Do you see that happening now where people take plastic so surgery. many? Yes, they take plastic surgery to change their faces. <clears throat> they just don't like the way that they look. So they want to look different. They want to, and there are people now who actually pay so much money to destroy their ears or to destroy their face because they want to look more like the devil. And this is a promise that Shaitan made at that time. Imagine. He was so smart. At that time, he says, I will put these weird desires in them that they will go crazy. And they won't see exactly what they're doing. It's just, you know, uh, it's beyond them. So, of course, may Allah protect us all from doing things like this. Um, then Allah says over here, Paradise is not obtained by your wishful thinking, nor by that of the people of the book. Whoever does a wrong will be will be recompensed for it and he will not find besides Allah protector or a helper. You 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 won't get Jannah just by saying that you want to go to Jannah. You won't get Jannah just because you're a Jew or because you are someone who's a Christian. You have to earn it. And whoever does good deeds, whether male or female, while being a believer, you have to be a Muslim, they will enter Jannah and they will not be wronged, even as much as the speck on a date seed. Not even that much will they be wronged. And who is better in religion than one who submits himself to Allah while being a doer of good and follows the religion of Ibrahim, inclining towards truth? And Allah took Ibrahim as a friend. Imagine Allah uh, yeah, oh, is calling his, Ibrahim his the, the friend, friend of Allah. Imagine that. Allah is given, uh, giving a human a title that this is my friend. And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens, whatever is on the earth, and ever is Allah of all things encompassing. And Ibrahim al-Islam was known for all of his sacrifices. right? And he did all of them for the, for the pleasure of Allah. So when you do jihad, that is one of the things that can, can qualify you to be a friend of Allah. Because all you want to do is earn his pleasure. And all you want to do is give up things that make you happy only because they end up making him happy. And the things that make Allah happy are things that uh, that involve a lot of hakukul ibad. He loves it when you go out of the way to help other people. He loves it when you go out of the way to forgive people. He loves it when you go out of the uh, you go out of your way to put a smile on someone's face. Muslim or non-Muslim, it doesn't matter. That's what he loves. So it's not like Allah says, I love it when you do things that make me happy because uh, God forbid, you know, Allah is selfish. No, Allah is saying what makes me happy is that you should be helping other people because that makes you a better person. That's when you become Ashraf al makhluk So if a non-believer uh, keeps on uh, helping people, uh, then Allah is happy with him. But he's a non-believer. Right, but we're talking about uh, Jannah. So as I just mentioned in this verse, you have to be a believer. That's what Allah says. But whether male or female. said a believer or unbeliever. I, I'm saying a Muslim who ends up helping other people, believer or non-believer. So you help a Muslim or you're helping a non-Muslim. It doesn't matter. You're helping mankind. Yeah. Allah loves that. Okay, because it, it makes you also an Ashraf al because you are choosing to sacrifice your desires for, a, you know, to put a smile on someone's face only because you know it'll make your God happy. That is something only the best of Allah's creations can do because it's really hard. So Allah says, and they request from you, O Muhammad, peace be upon him, a legal ruling concerning women. Say, Allah gives you a ruling about them and about what has been recited to you in, in the book concerning the orphan girls to whom you do not give what is decreed. And yet you desire to marry them. In other words, you have to give them the haqmer. And concerning the oppressed amongst the children and that you maintain for orphans their rights and justice and whatever you do of good, indeed Allah is ever knowing of it. It's the same verse being repeated. Right. But again, the idea being that for them, giving so much respect to women was just unheard of. It wasn't easy for them. And so Allah is saying, and if a woman, now here's something interesting. If a woman fears nushuz from no, her nushuz. husband, do you remember? Uh uh, when, the, uh, when the husband calls a divorce? No. Um, if a woman fears nushuz from her husband, contempt or evasion, there is no sin upon them if they make terms of settlement between them and settlement is best. 
and present in human souls is stinginess. But if you do good and fear Allah, then indeed Allah is ever uh, of what you do, well acquainted. You've forgotten. Um, we spoke about nushuz before where we said if a husband fears that his wife is doing nushuz, oh, oh, disloyalty, I, I then there were steps that had to be taken. Number one, and the point of the steps was don't jump towards divorce. Give her some time. So talk to her politely. Number two, have a separation inside the house. Number two, uh, number three, I said, was this it term called be... daraba. Right. Daraba, some scholars say you can strike, but majority of scholars, and I agree with the, major with, with the other scholars, is that it does not mean strike because that would uh, be resorting to physical abuse. And physical abuse is a complete violation. You're not allowed to do any kind of abuse towards a, a, towards a wife. And a wife, of course, should not do any abuse towards a husband either. So it cannot mean that. Doraba also means a barrier or a wall. So the idea being that you have complete separation in the sense that you're not even talking to each other. Okay? So mm -hmm. it's not, not just that you're, you've separated your bedrooms, but you're also complete separation. You're not even talking or looking at each other. Because that just shows the woman that now he's very serious. He's disgusted, so you better take your uh, take things seriously. And then the verse also explained that even then, if you have a situation where the two are just not getting together, you know, it's just hard for them to make it work, then you should have one arbiter from the man's family, one arbiter from the woman's family who come together and they try to make things work, right? Now, in the case of the woman... Allah is saying if the woman fears that her husband is doing nushuz, so she fears disloyalty from her husband. Does Allah say step number one, step number two, step number three, step no. number four? No. He says a settlement between you should be taken and a settlement is best. What does that mean? Divorce? Khula. Which settlement family? being that I'm going to give you half of my hakmer or I'm going to give you this much hakmer. I want my freedom. So in this situation, what can you see that Allah is in favor of? The women. And he's in favor of the women. So he, for the men, he's saying that take all these steps. Don't just jump towards divorce. But for the woman, he's saying if you see or if you fear disloyalty, go for a khula and that is best. End it. So if the man is not performing his obligations and you fear a disloyalty, then you simply end it. Right? And Allah is saying that is better for you. And furthermore, he says... Human souls are very stingy. But if you do good and fear Allah, then that is better. In other words, the man might have this feeling that, okay, you know, um, uh, this marriage is going to end or I'm not happy with my wife. But if I divorce her, then as we know, he cannot take back any gifts, right? But we also know that he cannot take back the haqmer if it's a talaq. But if it's a khula, then the woman, for her to get her freedom, what does she have to do? 50 she has to give back a certain portion of her hakmer. There has to be a settlement and then she gets her freedom. So the husband might say, okay, I'm not happy with her and this marriage is definitely going to end. But why should I give a talaq? I, you know, I, I will lose my entire hakmer. Why not make her life so miserable that she's forced to go for a khula? And then I can actually get back some of the hakmer and then this, this marriage can end. So Allah is saying, don't do that. Fear God. Indeed, Allah is ever with what you do acquainted. He knows what you're thinking. He knows exactly what you're doing. Okay? So again, a very strict um, thing being explained over here. And so last few verses and we'll end. It says, and you will never be able to be equal in feeling between your wives, even if you should strive to do so. So do not incline completely towards one and leave the other one hanging. And if you amend your affairs and fear Allah, indeed, Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. So when you have more than one wife, you're allowed, but there has to be equality. And Allah is saying that no matter how much you do, equality is hard. Because you can do equality in terms of material goods, like the gifts you give, the car, the house, and stuff like that. But in terms of your feelings, it's very difficult to be 100% equal. So Allah is saying that you won't be able to do it. But don't be in a situation where you are showing, giving a lot, a lot of your time to one and you leave the other one hanging. Like, so you give her uh, the house and the cars and, and, and uh, everything, but you don't want to spend any time with her. You don't even want to sit and talk to her because you're emotionally more inclined towards the other wives. So Allah is saying in that situation, if you, um, you know, if for example, you find it, uh, you are traveling for instance, 
or you're often away from your homes, then come together, bring your wives together and have a settlement of how you uh, plan to manage your time between all of them. Okay, so come up with a settlement that makes all of them happy. But do not say that because I don't like this one or because I have issues with, with this wife, I want to spend minimum time with her. Because then you will be held accountable. She is a human being. And again, her mental state is incredibly important and the husband will be held accountable for that. Okay, so inshallah we'll stop here. Continue with verses 131 in the next lecture. Assalamu alaikum.